Ich darf Ihnen den nächsten Keynote-Speaker ankündigen, Dr. Janusz Potocznik aus Slowenien. Er ist Professor für Ökonomie, hat dann aber schon in seiner Heimatwahl sozusagen Europaminister, ist dann 2004 bis 2014 Mitglied der Europäischen Kommission gewesen und danach Umweltkommissar und wie mir Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker gestern Abend beim Abendessen erzählt hat, einer, der sich wirklich engagiert hat, einer, der wirklich versucht hat, etwas zu verändern. Jetzt ist er Co-Vorsitzender des internationalen Ressourcenpanels. Das ist praktisch parallel zu diesem Klimapanel, was Sie vielleicht auch kennen. Und er ist Partner bei der Beratungsfirma Systemix, die auch versuchen, den Wandel voranzutragen. Bitte schön, Herr Dr. Potocznik. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for being here. And, uh, sharing with you some of the views of my previous work and also the work which I'm currently doing. So I will use the next 20 minutes actually starting where Nora uh, began the story, what is the problem, and then ending with how the solutions should look and which are the major things which we should address. So circular economy, new ideas for the resource efficient society. Let us first look quickly through what are the major challenges in the world in which we are living. It was mentioned that population is not the problem, which is true. But at the same time, it's a fact which we got used to, that in mid of the century, we will be approximately 9.7 billion. That means, if I translate it to a human language, that in one year you have on the planet additional population of Germany, in four years you have additional population of United States of America. In nine days and six hours, you have population of my country. <laughs> so all that is happening in the countries which are least developed, which aspire, and rightly so, to live as good as we do, which is just saying you that there will be enormous pressure on resources if we really do not change the way we live. Eight people own the same as the poorest half of the world. The richest 1% is more wealthy than the rest of the world. 800 million people are hungry. Over 2 billion suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. Over 2 billion people are obese. And we throw away one-third of the food we produce. We throw away also one-third of the land, one-third of the energy, human power, everything which is connected with the food production. Half of the cities which will exist in 2050 have not yet been built. China has used in three years, 11 till 13, more cement than the United States in the whole 20th century when they were building United States of America. There is increasing evidence of the climate change threat. 60% of ecosystems are already degraded, used unsustainably. Biodiversity is disappearing much quicker due to the presence of humans. 85% of the world's fisheries are at or beyond biological limits. One third of soils is degraded or used unsustainably due to various reasons. Seven million people die prematurely due to air pollution. Half of the million in Europe, which is approximately 20 times more than in car accidents. A million of plastic bottles are bought every minute globally. Only 9% of that is recycled and approximately 80% still lands in landfills or the environment. Nearly half of the work we do will be able to be automated by the mid of the century. Maybe you remember in 1997, Garry Kasparov, in the second attempt, was beaten by the uh, by, uh, uh, Deep Blue uh, computer. And Deep Blue, Deep Blue was entirely programmed by humans. But last year, Kiji, the World Go champion, was beaten, and Go is a more complicated game than actually the chess, was beaten by a computer which was not programmed at all. Only the data were given to the computer. It learned the game from the data and it beat the human champion. That's the artificial intelligence in which we are living. So, for the first time in the human history, we face the emergence of a single, tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. We are more interdependent and we are more uh, interconnected than ever, which means that our individual and collective responsibility has enormously increased. So, If I, if I try to show you this, uh, this is actually from the Club of Rome. 
they are claiming that the change which happened is that from the empty world, which was dominated by nature, we moved to a so-called full world, which is dominated by humans. The difference is that before labor and infrastructure were the limiting factors of human well-being, now it is the natural resources and environmental sinks which are the limiting factors of the human well-being. So, I do claim that in the 21st century, we do not have any more the luxury of thinking and making decisions based on the short-term thinking. So, this is an, uh, a kind of approach which is normally used in research when you approach it from environmental side of uh, perspective. It's called DPSIR framework. D stands, from, uh, D stands for uh, uh, drivers, P for pressures, C for, uh, S for state, I for impact, and R for responses. What is the problem? Normally, in our policy making, we focus on impact and uh, state. Even climate change, it's impact and state. Biodiversity disappearing, it's impact and state. We don't, many times, really go to the pressures and driving forces. When you mention pressures and driving forces, you mention humans and human activity. It's pretty straightforward. Why that's important? Because your responses are different. And it's, uh, if I give you one example from European life, it's not from environment, but from migration, which is one of the most central issues today in Europe. What we do is we build higher walls around Europe, and we put more security on the entrance, more army on the streets, but that's actually dealing with impact and state. If we would want to deal with the pressures and driving forces, Africa, our, actually, our policy would need to be, if I paraphrase American president, Africa first, because that's the only way how we could handle the problem in essence. So, <laughs> that's why the focus on our economy is extremely important. This is a bit simplified story how I do consider the major problems in our economic systems. You know that equilibria, according to economic theory, is always rich where prices and quantities meet. But let us think what are the price signals which we are thinking, uh, sending to the markets. Financial capital overvalued, overrewarded. Labor capital undervalued, underrewarded. Natural capital not valued, not rewarded at all. That goes to the market. Producers and consumers apparently behave rationally. And at the end, we are surprised that we are living in an economic model of imbalances in economic, social, and environmental sense. So it would be essential that this uh, is understood in a proper way. One thing which came from our research in the International Resource Panel, which I'm co-chairing, is that in the midterm, it will not be the shortage of resources which will cause that we, humans, need to change our behavior. But it will be the fact that environmental and health consequences of the use of those resources will force us to change. To give you one example, in China a few years ago, 2,000 companies around Beijing were closed. They were not closed because those companies were running out of any kind of material, any kind of resources. They were closed for a simple reason, because the use of those resources in excessive way caused the air pollution in Beijing, which forced the government to close those companies. So that's basically what we have to understand at this stage. So living well within ecological limits, where eco economic system is a function of the ecosystem, it's essential. And what is important is, in particular, environmental externalities. Because I've heard as an environmental minister on EU level a thousand times that you cannot introduce that and that because this will be additional cost for economic sector. By the way, those costs are already existed, existing, but they are not paid by producers and consumers. They are paid either by the health system or in the most cases by you, by the future generations, because you cannot complain. So it's essential that we understand that we cannot... that we cannot live in a world where profits are privatized and costs are simply socialized. This is a nice uh, overview of 
def different kind of pot potential measurement of economic activity. Normally, as you know, we are using the GDP. And if you use the GDP, then uh, it's pretty clear that these are the data for the years 1990, 2010, so 20 years, global economies. The GDP was growing 2.0. If you go down and include more social and natural capital, like in Human Development Index, Genuine Progress Indicator, Inclusive Wealth Index, you actually found out that in the last 20 years we were not growing. That a lot of that growth in the past was so-called bad growth and not actually the growth recorded because those costs were actually higher than the uh, profits which we have in the meantime created. So, to summarize, it's not helping if you are walking faster if you are walking in the wrong direction. And that's, in many cases, what is basically the case today. We have all done a serious commitment uh, in the SDGs, which you know pretty well. One of the conclusions from our scientific work is that trade-offs among 17 SDGs are simply unavoidable. But if you want to mitigate them, minimize them, then going in the direction of sustainable consumption and production is the best way. So when we look to all those SDGs, it's essential that we take goal responsible consumption and production as a central one, because without that you cannot eradicate poverty, you cannot create a world of zero hunger, it's simply impossible. So going to essentials of economics, it's for me uh, important. Resources, the missing link. This is the theory on which uh, maybe uh, uh, Professor Weizsäcker already mentioned that, on which we are working in the International Resource Panel, it's basically saying that the human well-being can grow faster than, uh, uh, than the economic activity, but economic activity should be decoupled from resource use, and both economic activity and resource use should be decoupled from environmental impacts. So that's the only way how we could go ahead seriously. Circular economy, that's the first time when I'm mentioning it. Actually, it was proposed by me when I was environment commissioner. So it was first seen as an environmental package. Later on, in two years, it developed, it transformed to an economic-based initiative with positive environmental and health consequences. But how we should see it in reality is as a part of the bigger picture of societal and cultural transformation needed to sustain humanity and also our prosperity. This is the butterfly which you all know pretty well. On the left-hand side, you have renewable, non-renewable, uh, to be clear, many times they are mixing the circular economy with the recyclability. Recycling is the worst of the good, because when you recycle, you have already used the resources. And cradle to cradle, if you wish, it's the best of the circular economy, and those principles should be in the essence of the circular economy when we are developing it. Which are the major questions which I see in development of the circular economy on which we have to focus? First, putting humans in the center. So we have to th if we want model to be accepted, we have to think about employment. And we have to think that the concept is accepted also by developing countries. So if you don't put humans in the center, they will consider that as a kind of new type of Western model which, through which we want to protect our our competitiveness, which is basically not the truth. Second, linking it to the climate change is essential. Why? This is the current climate policy. So we look through the carbon management and through uh, energy, so the supply side. Imagine the world in which you would have abundant energy, cheap energy, all renewable energy, current production and consumption systems and growing population. Do you think that we have settled the climate problem? Not at all. We have just settled more or less the, the energy sector problem, but the problem would be shifted to other sectors. And that's why it is essential that we approach to that also from the, from the demand perspective. So you need land management, water management, materials management, the decoupling of that story, and you need to look it comprehensively in a holistic way. We have the results, for example, of the recent material economics, it's a kind of Swedish advisory, which showed us that if you look it through that uh, system 
uh, they analyze steel, plastic, aluminum, and cement. And by the way, in the left baseline, it's all resource, uh, sorry, energy efficiency and energy policies are already included. But on the top of that, you can cut with the approach in, in demand side 56% of uh, uh, the CO2 emissions. So those two policies should work hand in hand. For example, if you look at shared mobility passenger car, CO2 impacts of materials could be cut 70% if you go that way. Total cost of ownership, 77%. Externalities and cost to society, 74%. So it's a new thinking, new model. We don't need to own the things. Light bulb is a problem for us. We need light. Car is actually many times a problem for us. We need mobility. Bioeconomy and the circular economy, this is also one of the developments you have to take seriously in consideration. It means that you transfer part of the products from non-renewable to a renewable side. What you have to be careful that when you use the concepts of bioeconomy, that they are subordinated to sustainability and circular economy. If not, you can create as much problems as with the classical economies. Next is urban system and circular economy. Sharing models, mobility systems, waste recycling, sustainable buildings, energy efficiency, a lot happens in the cities, and cities will be growing very fast. So we have a unique chance in the next generation or two to do the things right. Next one, it's retaining value in the circular economy. That's also a very interesting point, because if you look, uh, again, this was done in Sweden, if you look through through official statistics of the plastic, it's the case here, of waste recycling, the official statistics which is followed by the country and by the European Commission, and it's based on, on quantitative target, it's 53%. But if you look to the value which retains in the system, then from 10 billion Swedish crowns which are entering, at the end you actually get value retained 1.3 billion crowns. So, why that's important? 53% it's running political systems, and 13% it's running economics. Until those two will be too much separate, too much apart, you will have the problem, because economics and politics will not go in the right direction together. Then financing, sustainable financing, it's also a major problem, uh, because financing is still working uh, under the short-term regime very much. And finally, digital transformation and enabling conditions, sharing new business models, informing consumers, new technologies, distributed ledgers, and I can continue. So, a lot of the principles of circularity already exist decades ago, but were simply not possible. With the technologies which we today master, we can inform the consumer, empower the consumer, so that those decisions could be much easier taken and that the systems can be transformed. The whole mobility system is actually based on, on the on, uh, on the digital transformation. This is a very short explanation of 2018 circular economy package in the European Commission. I will certainly not go into details of that because I'm pretty sure you know it. If you would like to learn more, we can discuss it later. One thing on which, what I would finally like you to draw your attention, European Commission and member states have currently unique opportunity and also responsibility to align all existing funding instruments and policies to support the transition I'm talking about. Why? Because Agenda for Sustainable Development, SDGs, it's 2030. Next financial perspective, it's 21-27. There will not be another financial perspective. It is this or we will not do the job. So, in short, if this will not be done, if I go to my favorite band, the time is gone, the song is over, thought I something more to say. So, to conclude, I think we need to start from humans, and again, going to some quote, which is, this is from Jim Morrison, people are strange, uh, we want changes, but we don't want to change. And uh, I think it's uh, pretty much something which we have to take into account. So, new economic model, name it, Cradle to cradle, circular economy, green economy, resource efficiency, green, whatever. The, the essence is this, new economic model based on sustainable consumption and production, integrating all pillars of sustainability, it's simply necessary and unavoidable. We need to change the compass which is broken and it's leading us into the wrong direction. These are seven recommendations 
coming from the recent overarching International Resource Panel report. Set targets, measure the progress. Act on key leverage points across all levels of governance. Take advantage of leapfrogging opportunities. Implement a policy mix that builds incentives and corrects market failures. Promote innovations toward the circular economy, or you can say also cradle to cradle. Enable people to develop resource efficient solutions. And finally, unlock the resistance to change. One thing which needs to fundamentally change in the business sector, and I think it was my by pre previous speaker, it was very nicely explained how that works in practice, is that the responsibility of the business sector, being the farmers or producers in any area, needs to shift from only managing their own company risk to managing on the top of that also societal risks. Because that's essential if we really want to shift into the uh, right direction. These are the quotes or actually things which were written on World Ec Economic Forum, so uh, the major representatives of economic activity. Complexity and scale of these challenges require new forms of collaboration and more systemic approaches. The challenge seems not to be the one of inadequate scientific evidence anymore, rather it's the one of cooperation and implementation. There is a deepening perception of a lack of synchronicity between economic and environmental policy responses to global risk. So what I think would be really important is something like redefining sovereignty. That means, in essence, cooperating more. The best example, by the way, is European Union, because 70 years ago, we have to avoid conflicts and wars, agreed to raise a lot of sovereignty on European Union level. I'm not saying that Europe does not have problems, it has a lot of problems, but I'm just saying that, in essence, it works well. And I do believe that today, the world is facing pretty much the same problems. If we, if we want to avoid conflicts and wars in the future, we need to raise sovereignty from the national levels higher because only together we can solve some of the problems which humanity is today certainly facing. So if we are to avoid global extensive intersystemic crisis, frequent conflicts, then let's get serious about implementing what we have agreed in SDGs. Changes are unavoidable and humans are supposed to be intelligent. It's high time to prove it. Change will not appear by waiting for the leadership of others. Be the leaders on your level of governance, authority, politics, business, academia, civil society, in making your investment decisions. Some are saying that this is a story of gloom and doom which I firmly believe it's just the opposite. It's the story of major opportunities for our future development. And the alternative story, it's actually the one which I don't want to talk about because it's the story of gloom and doom. The circular economy genie, it's out of the bottle. Major economic actors have moved. Circular economy connects competitiveness and sustainability. It's about transition to a SDG-compliant economy. What is, for me, the major question and the major problem which we are facing? It's how to overcome the short-termism uh, which is inbuilt in our democratic political systems and institutions, public, financial, which is in fundamental conflict with the system change needed. I was 10 years the member of national government, 10 years the member of European government, we did not ever seriously talk strategic issues because that's not in the logic of political bodies. Will that be easy? When Albert Einstein was asked why it is that mankind has stretched so far as to discover the structure of the atom, but we have not been able to devise the political means to keep the atom from destroying us, he replied, this is simple, my friend, it's because politics is more difficult than physics. The story which I shared with you, it's pretty much the story of physics. Because in many cases, us humans are going against the physics. But the solutions are, unfortunately, many times in the hand of politics. So it will not be easy. Let me finish with a quote which I like a lot. Not that I would like to say with that quote that economics is not important, 
but rather that other things are also important. It's the quote from Professor Gim McPherson, uh, I think from Arizona University, if I remember well. If you think that the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath while counting your money. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>